Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming out and joining us on this very muggy Monday evening. Uh, we really appreciate it. My name is Amali, and I'm the events director here at Books for Magic. So we are so excited to have Greg Marshall and Chloe Cooper Jones with us tonight to celebrate the launch of Greg's debut memoir, Leg. <laughs> into all of that, I just have a few logistics to point out for how tonight's event is going to go. First off, mask wearing is optional tonight, but if you'd like an extra mask, we have some up at the front register where you checked in. We will be doing a hand-raised audience Q&A towards the end of the discussion, so please start thinking of questions to ask and hold on to them. After the talk tonight, Greg will be signing and personalizing books at the alcove next to where you checked in. We'll let you know where and when to start lining up for that. And lastly, if you're joining us virtually on the YouTube live stream, we would love to encourage you to buy a copy of Leg online using the link in the live stream description. All right, so let's get into this. Um, Y'all can sit down. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Um, Leg, for those who don't know, is a book of discoveries, a discovery of a cerebral palsy diagnosis that had been kept secret and a discovery of selfhood and sexual identity. Full of humor, honesty, and masterful storytelling, this book is wildly entertaining and extremely hard to put down. Greg Marshall was raised in Salt Lake City, Utah, a national endowment for the arts fellow in prose. Greg's work has appeared in the Best American Essays and has been supported by McDowell and the Corporation of Yaddo. As I mentioned earlier, Chloe Cooper Jones joins Greg in conversation tonight. Chloe is a philosophy, a philosophy professor, journalist, and the author of the memoir Easy Beauty, which was named a best book of 2022 by the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, and others. She's a contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine and lives here in Brooklyn, New York. All right, that's all from me. Without any further delay, please join me in giving Greg and Chloe a very warm welcome. Thank you all so, so much for coming. I would spend the entire time just sobbing, but I, it, it'd, it'd be touching for like 30 seconds and then just really humiliating, mostly for me, but also for all of you. So I will just read a few paragraphs and then we can talk. So th and thank, yeah, so just thank you all so much. I'm so looking forward to all of you buying me a drink <laughs> in like 30 to 45 minutes. Um, okay, here we go. Um, and this, this, uh, should, should we talk about the premise of the book at all? Or, or no, I'll just... I'll t I'll t we'll get there. Okay. Just read a little. We'll just launch in. Um, this one is called Sacre Bleu. Um, I picked up a few things in two years of French. I couldn't speak the language, but I could tell you that life overseas cantered along at a slower pace. Women went topless and ate sensible portions supplemented with cheese. Salad came after the main course. Frenchmen s smoked cigarettes without dropping dead and kissed each other on the cheek without being called faggots. When my French teacher, Monsieur Arnaud, proposed a trip to Paris, the Loire Valley, Normandy, and Brittany the summer after eighth grade, I was one of the first to sign up, to walk among the cobblestone streets in soft-toed shoes, to talk with my hands and wear turtlenecks without fear of judgment. This was the life for me. I may not have been much in the classroom, but it would be a different story once I hit the Champs-Élysées. Travel is transformational. All I needed was a crash course in pastries and conversation. In Paris, as I palled around with schoolboys and fashioned my pants into culottes, I would become Gregoire. <laughs> <laughs> Which Hannah and Zach call me all the time. <laughs> because I lacked both the sense of direction and the ability to put on my shoes in a timely fashion, mom was, was reticent about sending me abroad. My friend Robin was coming along, but with his giant head and hyperactive thyroid, he hardly counted as security. Mom would have gone, but she, uh, uh, with me, but she required Valium to fly, and, and anyway, she had lymphoma and two little girls whose parodies, she said, still needed wiping. After finishing Rituxan, Mom had spent the previous summer at a cancer hospital in Seattle, harvesting her stem cells for a future bone marrow um, transplant, the only potential cure on the horizon for a chronic cancer patient in her 40s with no known siblings and therefore, therefore no stem cell matches. We'd lived in a Marriott residence inn across the street from a Hooters, while mom underwent high-dose chemo and had her bones scraped out and the contents stored in a medical freezer. 
She returned to Salt Lake after the start of school that fall and took advantage of her cue ball cape by going as Uncle Fester for Halloween, a light bulb in her mouth. She'd run errands wearing a t-shirt proclaiming, I'm too sexy for my hair, that's how come it isn't there. But some days, even nearly a year after the bone marrow harvest, she was too run down to get out of bed. When I really pressed her, she admitted that she'd never been to Europe and didn't trust the water. Her blood counts were still too low, so she needed to avoid crowds and people with contagious illnesses, which in mom's estimation was 90% of France. That left my sweet uncultured dad to act, to act as chaperone. And I think I'll stop there. That's great, thank you. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well you were just saying right before you read, um, should we talk about the premise of the book? And I think we should, but part of the way that I wanna talk to you about the premise of the book and just getting like, you know, people here, maybe on the live stream who haven't read it or are not familiar with it to sort of get everybody grounded in it um, is to, instead of just saying what's the premise of the book, is to refer, I mean, I think every good book launch should really begin with a question about your tweets. Um, so, <laughs> so I'm gonna ask you about a tweet that you, that you um, tweeted a while ago that will kind of lead us into the premise, which is you were tweeting about how you were thinking about how writers, like what each sort of writer like really draws from and like what's i don't remember exactly how you phrased it but sort of like what's their well that they're always sort of returning to or like the richness of their life or their questions or their ideas they're sort of always moving into and generating material from do you remember this tweet i do remember this yeah tweet. <laughs> um and you were like you tagged me in it and you were like you know like chloe she's just writing from like this well of thinking roger federer is hot and like really <laughs> hanging out on that for like a long time which is nice to be recognized um in that way <laughs> But for you, you were talking about um, how so much of the book comes, and so much of your writing in general comes from the people that you love, like really mm -hmm. thinking about the relationships um, and your own sense of self in relation to your family, but, but not just your family. This book is filled with your friends and your husband and the people that have really shaped you um, and how so much of the premise of this book is searching um, so beautifully and so sensitively and brilliantly and very hysterically for a sense of of the truth of yourself, but always that searching seems to be in relation to others. And so I wondered if you could sort of talk about, you know, what the aim of this book is and why it feels so rich and important when you search for this premise of these central questions in direct relationship to the people that you're so intimately close to and love so much? Oh, that's a great question. I think my first goal was to just imbue myself with a body and with my body and my particular leg um, and its particular journey. Uh, and I think, you know, I wanted, I think that I'm a very kind of outward looking writer and I've, I've always looked for mirrors um, mm -hmm. in my own world to sort of, I, I've like never known, do other people feel this way? I've never known who the hell I am, mm -hmm. just like on a fundamental mm -hmm. level. And maybe, you know, maybe that's related to being gay and kind of having to ask questions about my desires and my body and what I want from my body. Um, and I also just grew up in a really rowdy, close family um, of people who were all very individual and who took up space and didn't have any problem taking up space. And so, you know, and I'm kind of the, the like Jan Brady of my family, or no, the Marcia Brady, who's like the, who's like the- Jan. 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 Yeah. <laughs> like, everyone's like, you're Jan. <laughs> uh-huh, thank you, Iris. <laughs> yeah, so these like sort of um, larger than life, you know, siblings and my lovely mom who's here and my, and my dad, and so um, they always seem, and they would probably tell a different story, but they always seemed so vividly themselves to me in the way that people you love maybe always seem just like themselves and fully formed. And to me, they were um, kind of flat characters, not in that they weren't on their own journeys, but that sort of like I was on this journey and I could look to their light and kind of see a reflection of myself in some ways. And it's true of, 
you know, lovers that I've had or husbands that I've topped after Renaissance festivals, <laughs> which we will talk about ad nauseum in Boston in front of my wonderful in-laws um, a couple days from now. Um, so I think I've now forgotten everything about your question except for Roger Federer being extremely hot. That was really um, that's the main thing. I think that's all we need. That's all we need. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I think, um, you know, there's so many things that this book is about, and I don't want to in any way sort of limit what, what I, I don't want to frame it in a specific way, but I do think because we're in conversation, there is an aspect of, of like overlap in our interests, which is disability specifically. Mm -hmm. And I think that whenever one writes about the body in any sort of way, but maybe specifically for us about disability, like one thing that, that is important is like, what's the context in which the body is understood in the family or in like early childhood experiences or in high school and all these things. And like you write so specifically about the bodies or the physical struggles or just the f also um, sort of physical gross habits of, of various <laughs> various family members. And, um, uh, and it's like, you're really sort of deep in this project, I think of in this book of like how everybody's sort of at, at, the, at the whim of the body or in this like very deep dialogue with the body. And I wonder if you can just set up a little bit like how unique your family situation is in terms of like, yeah, chronic cancer, ALS, like, and how, how your thought about your own body kind of rises out of that very sort of singular primordial soup of, of navigating the body at, in, in all these sort of val like vulnerable states. Yeah, well, I wanted to not just give myself a body. So kind of the, you know, one of the hooks of the book is that growing up, um, my parents didn't tell me I had cerebral palsy. They just said I had tight tendons mm -hmm. and we all just kind of left it at that. And so even though I had physical therapy and um, different surgeries and stuff on my legs, I never really identified as a person who was disabled, which, you know, was in some ways as much on me as it was on them, but it was just something that we all did. And so once I discovered at the age of 30 that I have cerebral palsy by going through my childhood medical records, I, I realized that everybody else had a body as well, mm -hmm. kind of in some way, and not just sort of this, before it had always been in this kind of classically gay, almost Grecian way where I would like worship others' bodies um, like Iris's high school boyfriend, Dave Mangum, um, <laughs> <laughs> that I spoke to join with at a Billy Strings concert twice last weekend and um, just never, never actually touched him, <laughs> even now. Um, <laughs> but I'm not hung up on it. At, like, at all. <laughs> but, you know, so, but it was, um, you know, so like uh, that, that guy has a very minor stutter or, you know, my mom's cancer, which you, you know, has so heroically battled, was another instance, a very overt instance of, you know, comedy and reckoning with the body and illness and survival. And, um, you know, but so in ways big and small, whether it was, you know, the other girl in my high school class, you know, inviting me mm -hmm. to, um, to prom and me having like a deeply ableist and horrifying reaction to it. I wanted to trace other people's, or I guess I wanted to trace my own bodily journey through looking at other people because it seems, I guess once I started looking a little bit, it just seemed like everybody was on this, you know, continuum of mortality where, uh, you know, that was filled with desire and death and grief, but also joy and fun and exuberance and like sex. And I wanted to kind of unpack that all in this big like confetti explosion of, um, of bodies and conditions and being really overt about, I think one reason I wanted to call the book leg was just to be like really overt about playing with kind of the notions of labels and kind of the idea of, you know, I think when I was trying to place individual essays and things over the years, I always had to kind of start from scratch and explain myself. And it was kind of this disability groundhog day where there'd have to be 
you know, the nut graft, as they say in journalism and, you know, gay fiction as well, <laughs> uh, where it was just sort of like, you know, you kind of get tired of having to go over the same, you know, basic facts about your body so that your story sort of makes sense. And so the book just let me kind of explain myself once really overtly and then hopefully um, explore so many more nuances and like have so much more happen in the book. Um, like I wanted the book very much to be about my life, but also about a million other things. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, course, you know, track that course of disability and queerness and see how they were sources of intimacy that drew us all together, you know, um, like pearls on a string rather than, you know, the typical conventional thinking of of, you know, isolation and shame and, you know, trying to hide your disability or hide your queerness. Um, because once it was just out in the open, I think I was able to see, I think I was just able to like go to vulnerable places mm -hmm. and kind of um, peel back. Yeah, peel them back. I was gonna make a really disgusting joke. But I was, <laughs> thank you, thank you, I know, I know, I won't. Um, and, and, then, and then find, and then once you're in that vulnerable place, you can take people to, you know, you know, to moments of humor or moments of hilarity, you know, or moments of real sadness. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I want to push you on this just a little bit because, you know, I think what you're talking about with this, like, overtness or being able to have that, like, here's the story of my leg or, like, these very overt paragraphs, like, in the journey of the book, that's pretty hard earned, right? And I think that there is... Um, there is a, a real tension throughout the book. And I think I, I, I'm glad that you brought up Carlotta because I think her story is kind of a moment like where these tensions explode. Mm -hmm. um, there's a real tension in the book about what kinds of things the body can go through that qualifies as heroic and what kinds of things have to be hidden, mm -hmm. what kinds of sexuality can be celebrated or explored in the basement of your house with a with a vibrator um, with a group of all your friends and <laughs> you know it's like it's okay if there's like a lot of mormons that are coming over and vibrate like with vibrators <laughs> and that's all that's a, okay but gayness is not right like being out is not so it's like there's this real sharp um threshold that i feel like the book is always exploring of Yes, questions about the body, but where do they fall on this spectrum of what needs to be hidden and what needs to be celebrated? It's very interesting that there's so much illness in your family and the illness is something that's that your family writes about, that they're that they're very vocal about, that it's extremely seen. It's in you know, published your mom writes about it in newspapers, and yet your disability is hidden from you until you discover it in grad school. And once it is discovered, the one of the first questions is like, are you gonna be filled with so much shame that you self-harm? So there is this sort of very intense dichotomy that you're always writing throughout the book of, um, or at least in the arc of the book, of trying to figure out which parts of your body could possibly be seen as valuable or accepted and which parts are hidden. And so I think I'm really curious, like, how how you conceptualize that and then how you actually think you do the work of reconciling it. And I wonder if on the way to answering that question, you would explain a little bit about how those things, I think, explode in the worst way with Carlotta, who's the other person in your school that has a limp. Mm -hmm. You guys are sort of paired together as like two disabled people. She gets a big crush on you. She does not know that you're a gay man. And there is this interesting intersection of like all the things that you feel like you have to hide or that could be socially given to you as um, like coded messages for shame, like all sort of coalesce with this dance, this poor, this, well, I feel so bad for both of you at this dance. No, yeah. You know? Yeah. And then the sort of the shame, like the, the, what that shame prompts in you with Carlotta. Yeah. I think that, um, I mean, the first thing that pops into my head is just how caustic the closet can be. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, to kind of borrow from 
queer liberation, the importance of being out of the closet, because so often when you're in a closet, somebody else is holding the keys. Yeah. Um, and you think that your safety depends on secrecy and silence, which can be true. Like the closet can be, a, it can be an important perch. I don't think that we can be exposed to, you know, the sun of our own enlightenment all day, every single day with, with Fry. And um, there were things that I certainly wasn't ready for, mm -hmm. um, you know, in my own, in my own journey um, that I feel, I think that one, I think that getting over internalized shame and kind of seeing the different um, cruelties that I inflicted on people and, and therefore on myself mm -hmm. is such a vital part of it. You know, like I never wanted to tell a story that was sort of like, I have a disability, therefore I'm perfect, or therefore I'm resilient, or therefore I have all the answers. Because the truth is, like, I still haven't had like a meaningful appointment with, you know, an orthopedic specialist who's actually like, talked me through my body. I've never, mm -hmm. it was truly just as simple as the words that I've read on, you know, in medical charts, and the stories that I've inherited and those that I've internalized. So I do think that the book is a little bit of like each chapter is kind of a case study in ableism and homophobia and hopefully yeah. in the reverse of, of, you know, disabled and queer joy. Um, but I think that there are so many, um, there were so many potholes in my own thinking and in my own reckoning. And I guess I just, I didn't want to erase those things um, because that just seemed so cowardly mm -hmm. to do, mm -hmm. um, but that they are, yeah, but, uh, but I think that those reckonings are things that we all have to go through in one way or another to hopefully reach some kind of at least temporary enlightenment or at least some kind of place within ourselves that feels where like life feels livable and tenable and that you can be generous both you know with others and with yourself yeah. um so i think that's kind of been yeah i think that's kind of been my journey mm. with it i guess and that it's very ongoing i feel like i have new thoughts and opinions every time i talk to somebody about the book um like i think becca was asking last night if i'm you know if i'm over, kind of over conversation or like you know i'm sort of like it's a kind of like i've written the book and now it's done and i feel like i'm so new to so many worlds that I'm just like eager to talk to people to just figure out what the hell I think, I guess, still. Yeah. 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 yeah I think that's, um, I think like everything you're articulating is like, I feel really core to the strength of this book and why it resonates so deeply with me and why I appreciate it. And I think it's why it's going to be useful and important to so many people because you do not edit out the hardest, most like painful things that you create, like mm -hmm. like pain that you create for yourself and other people, but you also are so good at contextualizing it as like, this is what this sort of reduction of the self or hiding of the self can create is this sort of cycle of hurt and harm. And I think the way that you talk about that, yeah, that scene, that sort of that real difficulty with um, with Carlotta and being associated with her at all, and and your your desire to to make fun of her and to you know it's so clear that that that's also that, that exactly as you're saying that it's it's a harm you're inflicting on the self so deeply. Mm -hmm. And she's another mirror. And she's really. another yeah, yeah absolutely. And she's she's the most painful mirror in a lot of ways, or she's a deeply painful mirror. Yeah. And like what that yeah, what that reflects back to you and how you navigate it. And I think if you had, if that wasn't in there, it would be harder to believe like mm -hmm. the truth of, of so much of the work that, that you do in this book. Yeah, I remember um, in, in college back in the old days, you know, there was kind of um, one of my gay history professors used to call it like the myth of isolation. Um, and George Chauncey has this amazing book called Gay New York that's kind of about um, you know, 
particularly gay men in his research, but just this rich gay culture that now seems so obvious because of like Ryan Murphy and, and, and things like that, but that, you know, you're not, even if you think you're kind of the only one uh, with a condition or the only gay one, the only disabled one, the truth is that like, you're not ever at all. Mm -hmm. There are always other people out there who have some things in common with you if you're willing to identify with them and see their own humanity. And if you're willing to, I think so often with disability in particular, and I'd be so interested in your take, I think we leave out the topic sentence that's sort of like, I have cerebral palsy, therefore da 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 da. And I think that at least in the culture that I grew up in, it was very much leave out the topic sentence, mm. but like go deep on the other stuff, kind of, kind of, but you're sort of like, I, you know, we kind of in some sense need the topic sentence, but then I find myself questioning, do I deserve another person's topic sentence or is that kind of their call to, um, mm. to, to give me the topic sentence or not? But I think that having come out um, as gay, you know, as a 19 year old, I think that I just so related to that liberation idea where I was sort of like, no, I want this and I want to own this and I want to see what the world is like this way because I'm so tired of being held back or mm -hmm. stuck on the shelf or feeling like the world is not mine to wander and explore because of these limitations, you know, many of them self-imposed. Sorry, that was yeah. so rambly, but... No, that's um, beautiful. That was beautiful. And yeah, I know you and I talked a little bit about this, like, people wanting to say to us, like, you're not really, you're not disabled. I don't <laughs> think of you as disabled. And it's like, it's not a bad word. It's actually like a really important, like, as you're saying, topic sentence or, or like the way that I need you to meet, like a place I need you to meet me rather than some sort of indictment of, or like it, but I think this gets, you know, I think there's two, two more things I really want to make sure we have time to talk about. And one is, um, I think that, and this is related is like, there's so many beautiful specific ways and you do this um, always through like concrete detail, which are really like scenes, like deeply embedded in scenes, but just little moments of illuminating how um, part of the disabled identity is dealing with other people's limited imagination of your complexity, or your fullness, or your intelligence. You talk about like people seeing you limp and putting you automatically in a remedial class yes. or like immediately taking you out of this type, you know, you, well, you don't play sports. You couldn't possibly play tennis or do any of these things. And is it raining? I don't know what's happening. Um, I'm so easily distracted. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's like, yeah, can you talk about just that, like the way that you try to bring in that sort of, I think, very universe. I mean, this book is so specific and singular, but I think you do a great job at moving out into the universal. And for the disabled experience, that is a really important move, is, is talking about the sort of life of dealing with other people's limited imagination. Um, and so can you talk about how that functions in this book and, and how that sort of forms a, a crucial layer of texture in the book? Yeah, I, well, I think it goes back to just wanting to be, and you've talked about this so beautifully, just wanting to be a full character on the page and kind of going places um, that traditional disability narratives haven't. You know, like I, you know, and we've talked about this, but thinking about after school specials yeah. and disabled people being there to inspire and inform able bodied people and just how radical it can be. I think that's, I mean, I haven't thought about this before, but I think that's one reason why there's so much in the book. Um, just that desire to kind of, just to fill it to the brim and kind of, and kind of, um, I don't know, I think I wanted to dazzle people a little bit and, and impress them and just sort of say, you think this book is about a leg, but it's about these million other things. And mm -hmm. even though the book is conversational, I also want to show you how kind of like smart I can be or that I was aware and paying attention and like taking notes the entire time, I think was kind of a, mm. a desire that I had. But I do, I think, I mean, you put it so well when you said like people kind of shut off their brains when disability comes, um, you know, comes up. And so just 
yeah, I don't know, kind of showing a slutty side or, or showing, like <laughs> yeah. a, you know, showing a, a naughtier side or like a really sharp tongue side or like a really tart um, side or even kind of like an angry side can be, I think we're still in a moment where that can be important. I think people yeah. can feel seen seeing that. Um, and I have felt seen as a reader when I've seen that um, on the page. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we're definitely still in a moment where it's like hugely, unfortunately, still a radical act for disability to, for someone who's writing about disability to present themselves as, as whole. Mm -hmm. um, and you do that so brilliantly throughout the book. Um, and one of the ways, and this is maybe, I have to look at the time, maybe the last question that I can ask you before we have to turn it over to your, to Wolfgang, who inevitably <laughs> asked the first question, um, is one of the ways that I think you uh, are so expansive and singular and whole in this book is through your use of humor. Um, I mean, this is undeniably, I think, one of the funniest books of the year, and, and the, the humor is often um, makes me laugh out loud and also makes me like, um, text Iris and go like, what, what, what is he doing? How can you put this in the book? And I get, I'm like, oh my God, you know, like, it's like, it's so painful at times, like, just in that you, and what I mean by that is like, you are often turning that humor inward to like, to, to really reveal yourself. Um, you use humor as a way of like, um, doing some serious, you, you don't ask anything of anyone else that you're not gonna ask double for yourself. And I think you do that through a lot of different methods of searching and one of them is is humor. And so I wanna ask you one, just like how you think of the variety of the tone in this book and how humor plays a crucial role in like keeping like a, a real depth of tone. But then also, were you trying to be like very thoughtful and careful about that that sort of magical line where hu humor can be a tool for like excavating the truth, but then like at a certain threshold, humor can also be a tool for self deflection. And I think humor in a memoir is a very tricky thing to like keep it on the right side of that line and not use it as a tool to sort of get the reader to look slightly away from something really painful. And I feel like you really do a great job of staying on the right side of that threshold. Mm. Um, and I'm curious if that's something that you that you sort of intuitively do, or if maybe Zach, your editor who's here, was like, dude, you're you're using this as a dodge, or and if he pushed you at all, or if early readers like Lucas like pushed you at all, and how you maybe like took tone and grew it over the many iterations um, of this book. Yeah, that's such a good question. I think that the book really grew up with me. I mean, I started working on it. Um, Jesse Aylin is here, um, an early champion of leg from when were we interacting, like 2015, 2016? So, um, and actually Jesse said something amazing um, when, and then he didn't buy my book. Uh, <laughs> but, um, no, but um, it was in that France essay that I wrote uh, or that I read from, and you just pointed to this moment that was sort of like, you know, oh, my dad didn't want to go on, like, this trip to France with his gay disabled son necessarily. He just, you know, kind of, I, I'm botching it, but he just basically wanted to make sure that I was okay, and kind of, kind of just this pullback moment. And I think once I realized, I thought that um, to write, you had to be just impossibly, impossibly, exhaustively specific and that you could never let language just do the work of language and i think when i realized that you could have these pullback moments and that it would make your work make a lot more sense i mean you know sort of to use news language like what's the hook here what's the mm -hmm. you know what's kind of drawing somebody into it um once i realized that you could have those moments i was so much more fluid in what i could write and once i i think also once i had the diagnosis of cerebral palsy in in a kind of counterintuitive way it gave me so much more distance from my own body because i could pull back and be like okay i'm a cat i'm this category of person or i have you know i i can kind of see in the world where i fit you know i am this brick in this road 
And before I didn't have that, I just was so kind of drowning in my own individuality. Um, and so to see that I was just part of this larger story kind of gave me more fluidity. And I think that just from a practical perspective, I worked on the book for so long that as I continued to write, um, I think the book, you know, kind of starts out in a pretty typical humor nonfiction vein, kind of maybe like the sort of thing that a celebrity would write if they wanted to never work again. Um, <laughs> you know, um, and then, you know, the stories kind of grew in complexity. So I think that, which, you know, sort of worked because the book started, you know, I start younger and get older and deal with more adult things as I age. Um, so I think that I, I'm excited to continue to write just to see kind of where that leads me. Um, and I don't know, I think I'm trying to think with Zach, with what we kind of did with the, with the humor. I think I just nailed it every single yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, I, I believe that. Um, well, I could ask you questions all night, but this time has gone so fast. We need to open it up and see if anyone has any questions for you. Yeah, it's, it's stunning young man in the front row here, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, were you ever hesitant to write this? Because you knew you have to tackle so much in the book. You know, you have to... Oh yeah, there was such a fear factor. I think that, um, I think that looking back, this is, I think I had Lucas. And so once I knew, um, I think that once I, well, I don't know, once you kind of have your ride or die partner, you're kind of, it does make you a little bit braver. And so once I knew that I would be loved no matter what, I could kind of just, you know, abuse this poor man. <laughs> um, but, you know, kind of, he was kind of my, my um, ballast, and I felt like I could just kind of fly anywhere, because I always knew that I could return to him. Um, but it, it is, it is scary publishing a book, and, um, but it's, yeah, yeah, I think that the fear is part of the reason why I wanted to do it, because I'm such a anxious, fearful, person in my life that I just wanted to, I think the book was the place where I kind of got to be brave and I was, the book kind of taught me how to take up space yeah. and that's something I'm still kind of learning to do. But uh, like you can't argue with the book, you know, you can not read the book, um, but you can't just, you know, shut it down and cut it off. So I think that I took courage in the fact that I could just hold forth for the length of an entire book. That was such a good question. Well, thank you. That's a great question. Anybody else? Yeah. Hi. It's so great to hear you. Um, I think you said that you learned of the diagnosis in your 30s, is that right? Yes. But you've been writing for a long time before that, is that right? I had been, yeah. So I was curious if you had any themes like about the body or, you know, were there any um, themes that continued in your earlier writing? Did it really take shape? That is such a good question. Um, my, well, let's see. I think that my, um, I think that in my fiction, my fiction was very like George Saunders knockoff fiction. Um, and I've literally, the only time I've ever had any fiction published was when Iris took pity on me and published a one page thing. Um, it's like I've sent things out for years and never gotten so much as a nibble of interest in my fiction. Um, but I think that, um, so I don't know, I would say that the humor was kind of the thing that was the, the carryover. Um, but I think that it was really once I was willing to write about my body, I kind of discovered my voice a little bit more. But I guess that's kind of dismissive of my earlier stuff. But it was, it was just young stuff, you know, it was kind of some journalism and then, um, yeah, 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 I, I think, I think the humor was the carryover. Anybody else? Yeah, I have a question. Um, you know, when you first started writing this book, you were writing about your own body and your own 
on the page, and that's kind of the official one. Mm -hmm. um, so are you going to have to do something like dramatic? Are you going to have to swim the English Channel now or something? Or are you that? done? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think... Is your career over. <laughs> Well, one of the things I, so I'm from a family of writers, and so one of the things um, that I wanted the book to do was to be very much my version of it. And there are kind of other versions of it out there in different form. And so, I, you know, I think you can kind of tell the same stories again and again from different perspectives, but um, it's so true. My, my Like so many nonfiction friends are like, and I love, I'm so excited for all these books, but it's like, oh, I'm going on a road trip with, you know, with my dog. And uh, Laura Huff, please don't be watching this uh, live stream. I'm actually very excited for your book. But like, you know, taking, kind of going on overt adventures is really a different form of nonfiction. It's like almost a whole different beast. So I do, I do wonder that. And if, if, you know, if this is kind of it, or if I'll write more and I, you know, I hope I write more, but I really don't know because these, um, yeah, this book was just so close to my heart and so me and so my identity that, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what agonies I can put Lucas through as I struggle to like <laughs> figure out what's next. <laughs> I think maybe there's time for one more question. If anybody has one last question for Gregoire. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm curious because I feel like we've come just a long way in like the information age of like the language around how we talk about disability, but I also am thinking of like people self-diagnosing on WebMD and like Googling their symptoms and everything. So do you think maybe if you've been born 15, 20 years later or something, do you think this would have still happened? Like, do you, Or do you think you maybe could have somehow figured it out for yourself? Have you thought about like the what if of it all? Oh, so much, yeah. I was like, did I not know how to put like, words into a search engine? Um, <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> I think that, you know, because I would, I would Google things, but like, because I didn't have, I think I was so dissociative and so I had such a cognitive block um, and was in such a neutral room, to use a term from Chloe's book, that I really, I didn't know if I could see it, even if it were right in front of me. So I think that part of it is kind of timeless. But I think that now um, a family might just choose to make it a core part of a kid's origin story and narrative, in which case it would probably be a lot less remarkable. But I still, I still think there is stigma and ableism and I don't know what do you think about that Chloe? Yeah I think there's there's tons of that but I do believe that um I don't know I think it is possible that that we're doing a little bit of the work of of trying to untangle that and so I really like what you're saying it's like yeah maybe I would have learned to google it but actually maybe it just wouldn't have been this shameful thing mm -hmm. um and that would have actually done you know, that, that could have created a really different life for you. Yeah. 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 I could have been a morning news anchor. Yeah. <laughs> you do have the teeth for it. <laughs> they are fake. <laughs> um, well, I think that's all we have. We have books for sale. You're going to sign them all. This is amazing. We love your book. And let's give Greg a huge round of applause. <laughs> Thank you to everyone who asked questions. Thank you to Chloe for moderating such a wonderful discussion. And of course, thank you to Greg for celebrating this fantastic debut with us. So as Chloe just mentioned, we have plenty of additional copies available for purchase, um, which Greg will be signing and personalizing. We also have some copies of Chloe's memoir, Easy Beauty, which is so good. Highly, highly recommend. It's a wonderful accompanying read as well. And it's out in paperback. So it can fit right in to your bag, right next to your copy of Leg. Um, 
And to those who are still with us on the YouTube live stream, you can buy copies of both of their books by clicking the link in the live stream description. So Greg will be signing at the little alcove right next to our register. Um, my coworker Colleen is gonna point right now to where that is. Yes, because it's a little bit hidden, but it'll all make sense in a second. So we ask that you all line up down the center aisle and curve um, towards the wall. Please make sure to grab all of your personal belongings with you so that we can start to break down the space and rearrange everything. I think that's all I have to say. So let's give Greg and Chloe one last round of applause. Thank you all so much.